All right, hey guys, gonna do another Talk Ink video for you. This one will be a little bit more time consuming because we got some motorcycles and uh, stuff like that. Anyway, it ought to be okay. I'll, I'll just get into it. So you might be wondering how I learned how to draw motorcycles so precisely. And uh, I will answer that question at, uh, with uh, Google. Google Images. I just did a Google search for old motorcycles. Found one that I really liked. And this will let so many people down, but I just I just took it into Photoshop and traced over it. And added just a couple little details that were different. And uh, and then printed out my traced motorcycle and that's what I got right here. A printed out traced motorcycle from Google search. So see there's really no secret anymore. It's all been revealed. I just I'm a tracer. I'm a tracer. It's sad. But anyway, um yes, there's some there's a good money in tracing. I learned that when I was working in storyboards. There was an awful lot of tracing going on, thus, thus everyone using tracing paper. But anyway, so don't be afraid to trace. I think, you know, I think you actually learn a lot by tracing. One of my, my first paid art job was actually taking pictures of my friends under heavy lighting like really really intense lighting and with a black backdrop and I would uh, trace them with a light table and make them look like vampires for Vampire the Masquerade that role-playing game it was real popular back in the 90s I don't know I don't know I, I'm assuming it still exists now I, I don't know I never really played it so I was never really into into role-playing game as a thing to do I, but I sure loved doing art for role-playing game books because wow I could actually get paid for it and that was my first job first paid art job with a company it was with White Wolf so that was cool so anyway I, I learned an awful lot about lighting and you know like inking and cross hatching and just how to you know how lights shine on people's faces uh, by tracing <laughs> and you know when you have a scene like this where you have a motorcycle that you will probably never see for the rest of the comic and you want it to look good, you could you could just make you could spend a lot of time making something, you know? From scratch. Inventing a brand new motorcycle. Or you could just find something that exists. There's all there's all kinds of stuff that is really um unique. Like if you just do searches now. You know, there's a lot of old, like, military-type stuff. I don't even know what some of this detail is that I'm drawing. It's kind of so... It's so little. That's the nice thing about an ink brush, is you can kind of, like, cheat. Cheat things. And it kind of looks like, wow, there's a lot of detail in there. When really it's just kind of like blobs. And you can kind of put in a lot of black clumps in this detail. And it just brings out, brings out cool little shapes and 
patterns and details that really make it look like you know what these things are, but they're just they're just lines and blobs. I mean, yeah, I know what this fender looks like, but or this mud flap, I guess, looks like. But all this stuff, I don't know. Yeah, that's looking pretty good, I think. I mean, now that you know the secret. I always like to uh, refer to Kung Fu Panda 1 when people ask me, what's the secret? Kung Fu Panda 1 explains what the secret is to doing something like this. Specifically, it was Mr. Ping's noodle recipe. What was his secret? And Poe found out at the end of the movie that there was no secret. And you could infuse all kinds of other things into that and say that the secret is love. You love it and that's the secret. That's the secret sauce. And I will have to back that up and say yes, you gotta love it. You gotta love doing this stuff, otherwise you won't put in the time to make it look like you have some secret. You know, people people see me drawing and they go they go, man, it's just it's so natural. Well, it's, it's natural because I've put in the time. It's just like a mechanic working on a motorcycle like this. Like, someone who's worked on a lot of motorcycles naturally knows what's a waste of time and what's not. What works and what doesn't. And, uh, I've learned my strengths and weaknesses over the years. I've learned what is a waste of time <laughs> for me to try to do. And so I focus on my strengths and I focus on making my strengths even stronger. So that's why when I did Remind, I, I said, you know what, I'm going to do it with a pencil because I am so much better at pencil than I am at ink. Why would I spend all this time trying to ink when I'm so when my pencils are strong? Let's focus on my strengths. I think that was a real good decision for that first book. And then over the years I started playing with inking and got more comfortable with it. And it started getting fun. So I focused on the inking. I actually did some inking on the second half of Remind, or Remind 2, I, I inked some pages. And um, I was surprised that it's not, it's not super easy to spot. If you're looking for it, you can tell. <laughs> but, you know, I still don't think it, Inking is my strength, but but I enjoy it, and that's why I'm doing it this time around. And who knows, maybe by the time I'm done, maybe it really will be a strength. But maybe I'll retire it and move on to something else. You know? Or maybe I'll find a new brush that's amazing. I keep... I keep thinking about trying these different brushes that people are talking about, and it would probably be smart of me to to try some different brushes that are have a little bit more control. But I just, I, I guess I'm just lazy. I once I start doing something one way, it's it's hard for me to to change it. You know, it's like when I go to a restaurant, I tend to order the same thing if I know I like it. I know there's people that like to experiment when they go to restaurants and they like to try something different every time and that is not me. Once I 
know what I like. I'm comfortable with it. It's it's nice to just have that knowledge that you're gonna get something and you're gonna know how it's gonna taste. So that's kind of how it is with brushes. I, I know this brush and so I don't have to worry about it if it's gonna be different or or what, you know. It is what it is. This brush is what it is. And that's the dumbest line in the world. It is what it is. I would have never thought to make these spokes like this. I mean, I've seen spokes on bikes before that are like this, but it, I would have never naturally just put this nice little spoke pattern into it. So it's stuff like that that really... Well, no, I'm sure you can't see that. It's stuff like that that really makes you know, these drawings look, look neat, I think. It's just a little detail like this. You know, if I if I had a comic with a bike in it, then I would totally probably learn how to draw bikes really good. If that was my main main way of transportation, but I'd probably also like have some sort. I would probably make up some sort of bike, like later on, like the vehicle they get into. There's this thing called a sand ski, and I actually designed it, you know, out of my head and. Based on you know the how I wanted wanted it to look, I looked up similar kind of machinery, and then I uh, did some sketches and I sent it to a modeler, and he modeled it based on my sketches, not this bike, but my my Sansky machine, and that ended up being the thing that I moved around in 3D space and. I print it, I, you know, I, I pretty much do the same thing as I did with this bike, but it's something I created based on my designs. And uh, I can find the right angle with the 3D model and, uh, and um, get a screen capture of it and it's, you know, tra trace over it. And it looks awesome. Man, this is so small. I'm not really able to see some of this detail. Usually I kind of like, I say, okay, well, if, he, if the character is this small, then I will just kind of eliminate a lot of this detail in the sketch. But in this one, I kind of went buck wild, eh? I got in there and made, I must have zoomed in in Photoshop, basically. Too much. Too much zooming in is a bad thing. No, I don't know. It is for me, because then it's kind of pointless when I go to ink. I, I lose a lot of the detail that I, that I really liked. So I try not to zoom in too much in Photoshop when I'm sketching. little tiny lines are this is what I need a fancy brush for huh Let's see how do I do this without smashing my head into the camera normally my face would be up a little closer to the art I'm doing it from the side I guess it's working As long as you don't see my hair, I can't tell. So, curious what kind of things you guys would like me to talk about in these videos. 
because they're they're kind of it's kind of fun and motivating to to start a camera and then start talking because you know you got to keep working you can't stop space off like I normally do got to keep going but I will color it black like my sketch okay so yeah back to the secret you know, the secret is there is no secret you just do it did I move the camera? oh no anyway you just do it. That's my secret. Just do it. Just start working on something. You know? I didn't need no stinking contract to start making comics when I was in high school. I didn't need a paycheck to start drawing when I was when I was in grade school. You know? People who don't love it are not going to put in that time, but people who love it are going to naturally put in that time. It's, it's like a no-brainer. They're not, they're not thinking about it. You know, you, you really got to just love it to the point to where you're not thinking about how much time you're obsessing over this stuff. You know, there's a time later on in life where you have to weigh all that stuff. But I think when you're, you know, you're, it's a hobby. Well, I mean, for instance, if it's a hobby, you love it. You're, you want to spend time doing it, right? If your hobby is snowboarding, you are not going to sit here and go, oh, it took me too long to ride down that hill. I, I don't know. Just, it, I had to snowboard all day. It's just not worth it because I had to do it all day. Too much time snowboarding. You know? And especially, you'll say it in that kind of way of that tone. You know? Um. But you know what I'm saying? Like, if snowboarding is your hobby, you're not going to be frustrated because you're not... Because you're putting in too much time and because it costs money and because, I mean... You will be frustrated if it costs too much money and you don't have it, but, you know, you're going to do it. You're going to put in that time and practice because you love it, because it's so much fun. Not because you're trying to become a professional snowboarder. And I guess I could be wrong. There's probably some people out there who are doing it just to be a professional. But I think e even if that's the case, they started out doing it because they loved it. And they got so good at it because they loved it that they started realizing that they could get paid for it. You know, that really changes the dynamic once you once you start thinking about it as a business and about getting paid for things. You know, I think, it, I, you know, I've heard that it, what was it, on that Chris Oatley interview where he said, it was a quote from somebody else who said, art stops being art once there's money involved. And both Chris and I told, didn't quite agree with it. Um, I don't know. I just I don't think that's fully true because it's art when you love it, I think. You can get paid for things you love to do. And if, I don't know. I think if you're not getting paid for things you love to do, then there's a problem then it's probably not art. If you're getting paid for it and you don't love to do it anymore, then it's probably... Well, it's still art, probably, but it's just... not good art. Okay. I don't know. Like I worked at DreamWorks and... you know, I... I can't say that I... felt satisfied when I'd go home after working on a DreamWorks movie because it wasn't really I was I was obviously doing it 
because I loved art. I got good enough at art to where I could get hired, but I would have never chosen to do, to like work on Kung Fu Panda but on my free time for fun, for the love of it, you know? I was getting paid for it because I loved doing art so much that I got good at it. And I was able to actually produce what was needed. But... Sorry, focusing a little too hard here. <laughs> But at the end of the day, on all those jobs, I was doing it for the money I needed. I needed that paycheck to pay the bills. I wouldn't be in there. Oh, this is good and getting bad. I wouldn't have been in there, you know, all day long if it wasn't going to give me what I needed, which was the money to pay my bills. And there's, you know, there's a... There's an art to it, you know, like... I, there's an art to art, <laughs> there's, you know, when I worked at DreamWorks, I, I treated it like an education, so there was, there was multiple things I was getting out of it, I wasn't just getting like a paycheck, I was, I looked at it like, this is how I am going to learn to do color theory, is that DreamWorks, because I never went to school, art school, I never went to college, and um, so when I got into DreamWorks, and I'm working with these amazing, amazing artists, I, um, you know, I looked at that as a, a chance to just learn, like I've never been able to learn before, about color. And so I kind of lost all interest in animation when I got into DreamWorks, and I focused completely on learning how to color. I submitted my portfolio because I was doing After Effects. That's how I got in. And um, I submitted my portfolio to do visual development because that's what I knew I could really learn from. I mean, that's I'm not, not that. It's, it's, that's what I decided I really wanted to learn at that time was visual development style uh, color theory and stuff. I mean, you see the color theory on those movies and it just blows your mind. Blows my mind, anyway. And so I wanted to learn that. That was my focus. You know, so I was getting... I felt like, this is good, I'm getting paid and I need to. I have a young kid at home. Um, I need to pay the bills. I have a mortgage. So this is good. This is what I need right now, but I'm also able to um, learn, like have that education. Instead of paying for the education, I'm getting paid to have that education. And I think if you can kind of find that thing that you want to have an education about in your jobs, then it makes your job so much more doable, so much more meaningful, you know? Like, I don't know. I mean, some people like to just contribute to big movies, and that's that's their goal in life. But I don't know how people can be fulfilled by that myself. I just... At the end of the day, it's just another movie, right? I mean, you could say that about my comic, but... But I wrote this, and I, I really believe in it, and I think it's... I think I'm the only one who can do this book. And at the end of my life, I think, it, you know, I want to do these things and I'm proud of these stories that meant something to me. Not just a story because it's a big Hollywood movie. So. But, you know, I, I, I was able to get a really good education out of DreamWorks. And there's a lot more I could have learned there. And I could have worked there the rest of my life and still, you know felt like a newbie because there's so much talent it's there's so many people there who have amazing skills and strengths and all these different diverse things I don't know what I'm drawing right here 
and there's you know there's so much talent all around you and they're they're all good at something really really good at something one thing or all really good at many things but the reason I say one thing is because I I believe that to get into an industry into a a field if you focus on being really good at one thing then your chances of getting in because you excel at that one thing more than anyone else it's, it, it increases your chances of of actually getting in there so the one like for instance the one thing that I was really good at was After Effects making After Effects this animation software work with um, with animation like with cell animation that's what I obsessed over and I focused on that because I was trying to make Remind into an animation at that time. So I was really, really focused on, you know, how you can make traditional looking animation with the computer, with software, different shortcuts. So I would get these this software and I would just experiment like crazy on it and figure out all kinds of different ways to use it for traditional animation even though it wasn't necessarily made for that. So when studios needed someone to, you know, be able to figure this stuff out and cut corners and invent new ways of using this stuff, they called they called me once they started realizing that that's what I'm obsessed over and that no one else was obsessed over that kind of thing. You know, everyone else at that time was getting into CG style uh, animation. So they would all learn the 3D software, and Disney's laying off all their 2D artists, and I'm sitting here going, I'm, I'm going to figure out how to make cell animation my job. And I'm going to make cell animation because I like it, and blah, 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 blah. And so when studios needed cell animators, everyone else was focusing on CG stuff. And I was, um, I, it seemed like I was the only one who cared about trying to do traditional animation and and figure out ways to do it in the computer, you know? Because everyone else was like, well, why don't you just use a 3D program then? I'm like, no, that's not cool. I want to draw it and use software to make it look awesomer. Awesomer. <laughs> Sorry, I keep sniffing. So, you know that. So focusing on one strength, getting better at every, at, better than everyone else at one thing, is really a powerful way to to kind of get in the door of places. I think. So, and I tell people, I you know I don't know what that one thing is. It may be it may be drawing rocks for all I know. It may be you know, dr making smoke animation. It may be, it may be doing something, you know, it, it doesn't have to be drawing, it can be anything. But just getting so good at something you're obsessed with, you know, that other people just aren't naturally obsessed with it. And just focusing on that, just really ho hone your skills on that thing. And um, it's amazing what kind of doors open when you do things with 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 things that you're you know obsessed over. Like for me, it was I wanted to animate traditional animation, and then use After Effects and other computer software to to make my traditional animation look really neat. And I want to be able to do it all myself, you know? Like, before that there was a lot of... There's flash animators that can do it themselves. There's... You know, um... There's other ways to do it all yourself, but it kind of all looks kind of fast and sloppy. I was trying to imitate, like, 
traditional animation and actually do traditional animation um, and find ways to to make it look like real like so that people thought that it was fully traditional and traditionally animated you know with without actually building a character in 3d and putting a cell shader on it and stuff I mean this is kind of before a lot of that started getting good looking like now now you can kind of do some of that <laughs> pretty good um, anyway I might be mumbling a little too much about animation <laughs> but um, but you know I, I worked at Motion Design Studios because they didn't know anyone else who could kind of do it all they, I could animate it I could scan it in I knew the software the scanning tools I knew how to do all this like really um, annoying stuff that someone else would have a would have to put in years to learn it and I, I just I knew it I understood it because I had struggled with it for years and I invented a lot of new ways of doing things with like After Effects and traditional animation <laughs> so these studios would like pass my name around you know someone needed more someone if someone a studio needed someone to to lead a team of animators they would they'd call me because I was able to to, to do all those pieces and I'd come into a studio a little motion design studio and they'd be like what do you need and I'm like well I need a scanner I need peg boards I need this kind of paper I need some light boxes I need to get some in betweeners I need you know we need to get like Toon Boom Studio, which was one of the ways to to uh, to color it, or or we could just do it all in Photoshop. But we need to, you know, it needs to be done a certain way then, or we could just do it all flat, or we could do this, or blah blah blah. You know, I I kind of like laid out all their options, or we could fake it and do this and use these tricks in After Effects and. There's a, some weird, weird like programs that um, nobody used, but some random people just made it for animation, and I learned it and used used it in some commercials. And man, it was hard to find people to use software that no one's. <laughs> Even though you know you can use software that no one else knows, it's you kind of shoot yourself in the foot because. If suddenly you have a whole pile of scenes that have to be done, you can't hire out someone else to do to do these scenes because no one knows the software. So I got into the trouble doing that kind of stuff before. But you know, we always got it done. I don't know what all this stuff is in the background here. It's just kind of like random details. Anyway, we, um, these studios would pass my name around, and eventually we needed, there was this really big job for Microsoft Windows that, um, there was like 10 commercials or something, they're all traditionally animated and all high, high design, and we got the job, well, this company got the job that always would hire me to do the cell animation stuff and we needed some top notch, notch animators and some of the people that I worked with one of the guys knew uh, James Baxter who if you guys don't know of him look him up and you'll be blown away with what he's done um, in my mind he's the the best American animator there is right now he's kind of like the modern day legend in animation in, in the American animation world. There's Glenn Keane too, but I like to I like to look at it as two two different camps of people. There's either Glenn Keane anim animators or James Baxter animators. Glenn Keane is very everything's really fluid and emotional and it's all about feeling. And James Baxter is it's very technically perfect. But it, I mean in, in my opinion it's all very has great emotion in it too, but 
it's just a lot more technically accurate. And it just blows your mind when you see him animate something really fast that is just insane. Anyway, um, he uh, started a studio because I guess Shrek 2 came out and did amazingly well. And uh, everyone got big bonuses. And he got a big bonus and he left DreamWorks and he started this his own studio called James Baxter Animation. And he was looking for jobs, and so we um, hired him to animate um, some of these commercials for this Windows job. And um, I was one of the um, I was kind of the the character designer and lead designer on a couple of the different ones different spots and so I had these characters that you know I needed to do all this crazy animation with and so we brought him in and I met him and um, man this is so detailed I can't see what I'm drawing it's an example of stuff being too zoomed out anyway so we brought James Baxter in um, and he animated uh, some commercials that I designed, and they're amazing looking. They were amazing, and the company didn't really treat him very good. They just thought he was like an animator, so they're like, "Whatever, do your job, get out of here." Um, but anyway, later on, he he was seeing how I was taking the animation that he was giving me and doing stuff with it, and really cool stuff with it in the computer and he hired me to uh, help him work on the intro of Kung Fu Panda 1 the dream sequence and I didn't know what it was and you know at the time but went in and I was like James Baxter sure I'll work for you I would love to so you know um Oh, what's that? It's some sort of thing blowing up on my phone. What is it? Get money. Alright. I got apparently I gotta get money. Um So James Baxter hired me to work on that and it was basically because I was showing him some really weird things that I was experimenting with with my own animation and stuff at that studio and so he, there was a couple times when he had me come in and um, give him like tutorials on how to use different software and so so I think I just you know got on his good side and he realized that he could probably hire me and I would help, be able to help him make their stuff look look better and pull some tricks to not pull some tricks but cut some corners to to make make their animation look better in the computer and he wouldn't have to do all this work it, it would be you know less work for him but he could still do it um, so they hired me and that was fun I worked with Eric Tillmans um, it was Eric Tillmans and I who did all the animation in After Effects for Kung Fu Panda 1, that opening sequence. And uh, between the two of us, we know we did a lot of background character animation. And uh, James, of course, did all the, the main animation. But there was a lot of scenes where we, we um, were responsible for animating the characters in After Effects. And then James would come and look at it and give us little pointers. And we'd tweak it, and surprisingly, it looked really good, and it all blended together. And we showed James how to animate in After Effects, and he did a couple scenes where he animated the really complicated scenes, and with all these characters in After Effects, and it just looks great. And it seems like to me, like to this day, people still love that dream sequence style more than anything in that movie, and. 
and you know we we kind of kept trying to pull in interesting different animation styles in the rest, in the other kung fu panda movies and it's all because you know it worked so well people responded so well to it anyway so james baxter's studio closed down and um i don't know the details but they all we all kind of went in the back door of dreamworks and so that's what got me into dreamworks was obsessing over making 2D animation in the computer and, and figuring out other ways to do it that no one else has done before. So because of that obsession and me focusing on that one thing, um, oops, is my phone still recording? It is good. Because of focusing on that one thing, you know, it opened up a lot of doors for me. And And then um, I, I finished up on Kung Fu Panda 1. Worked on the end credits a little bit. So i got to move this. And let's see if I can get this right. Okay. And worked on the end credits. And, um, and then I... I was freelance at that time at DreamWorks, so, but I met a bunch of people, you know. I met like Tang Hang, the art director, and Ramon Zibok, the production designer, and just kind of became friends with them, and, and they, they thought I did great, good animation, you know, they were always impressed with the different stuff I could do in After Effects, and James really talked highly of me too, to everybody, and so, you know, got it got my name around the studio a little bit that I did this stuff and I wanted to but I wanted to do the the art you know I wanted to start doing the viz dev I saw this viz dev that they were doing and it just blew my mind and I was like how did these guys get in here I didn't even know there was a job for this and um so I I you know I had made also friends with viz dev artists because I was taking their artwork and animating it. And I just said to some of them, I was like, hey, like Jason Shire, good friend of mine. I said, hey, Jason, you know, can you look at my art? I would, I'm wondering if I would be able to do viz dev, you know? He looked at it and he's like, dude, you should totally apply. And he's like, I didn't know you could do this. I was like, yeah, I, I would love to do this. And at the time, my, my viz dev was basically the first chapter of Remind. And there was a, a friend of mine who wrote the script and hired me to do a bunch of big pieces of artwork for it, like big paintings. And so, you know, it was about robots and dinosaurs. It was awesome. And so I had these big pieces of art and then Remind pages. And that was my portfolio. And then random other pieces, but mainly that's it. And um, so I showed it to another VizDev artist. I was like, hey, do you think I could get into VizDev here if I applied? And the, 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 art, uh, the, the other artist, um, his name was Sean Eccles. He's an amazing artist. Um, he was just like, he was like, dude, you're, you are a VizDev artist. Like, why are you even questioning it? Like, it's obvious. That's what you should be doing. You know, so it's kind of encouraging. And so then I went to the art director. Went up a little, another notch to the art director, which was Tang Hang. And Tang and I had, you know, become good, pretty good friends, I think. And we were comfortable around each other, joked around a lot. And so I just went into his office and I was like, hey, Tang, can I show you this? portfolio that I have. I'm curious if you think I could do this viz dev thing. He's like, you do viz dev? And I was like, well, I think so. Yeah, I guess. So showed him and he's like, I didn't know you could draw and paint and stuff like that. And I was like, well, yeah, that's what I would like to do. I mean, After Effects is fun, but the reason I learned After Effects is so I could do my own animation not so I could do After Effects at a studio. 
And he's like, well, let me um, let me show your portfolio to... Actually, at that time, I didn't have a portfolio. I just had stuff on a disk, you know, files. He's like, put together a book, like a portfolio book, and, and bring it in and I'll... What do you say? I'll, like, show it to Ramon, the production designer. And Ramon's kind of the one in charge. He was kind of the one in charge of hiring or picking who he wanted on his team. You know, and I, I knew Ramon too, but, you know, we wanted to, I wanted to make sure to go through the right doors first. And, um, so I put together my portfolio and I, I don't remember if I showed Ramon or if Tang showed Ramon, but we showed Ramon and, and he was like, man, I didn't know you could do this. I was like, yeah, this is what I really want to do. I want to, you know, I'm not good, that good at color, but I want to learn it. You know, even though I had color pieces in there, they just, it wasn't very many. And Remind was in color, obviously, too. And he's like, well, the cool thing is, is you could do both VizDev and animation. You could do VizDev animation. And I was like, yeah, I guess, you know, but I, I would rather just do VizDev. So, at this time, we weren't, you know, I wasn't full-time, I was just freelance, my wife was pregnant, and we were living in a little tiny house about an hour's drive away, and so we, uh, we basically put our house on the market and, and moved to uh, Burbank uh, area, it was Glendale actually, and got an apartment there. And it was like, my wife was like, I don't know, six months, you know, eight, seven months at this time. We moved. And I didn't have a job, but I <laughs> I just believed that it would happen. It just seemed like it was going to happen. And um, I didn't bother Ramon about it too much, I don't think. But I would email him once in a blue moon and be like, hey, Ramon, do you think, you know... I could get in doing BizDev on Kung Fu Panda 2. And he was like, oh, I, I put in your name and I, I, you know, I've done as much as I can. I'm just waiting to hear back. You know, one, you know, once it starts, I'll be able to let you know a bet, better answer. And he's like, I want you on my team, but that doesn't mean, you know, they're going to just hire you. You know, so, because they have all these other artists that are on Gap. And Gap is when, you know, they have an artist, but they don't have anything for him, and so he is paid to just come and sit, sit and do nothing. So they would rather put these artists that are on Gap on movies. <laughs> anyway, so so I just waited, and we moved. We basically moved, and I did, I think, a couple freelance jobs. Um, still back in the places where I used to work. So I'd drive back towards the other direction, <laughs> do some freelance jobs, and then my wife, my wife basically uh, went into labor when I was at a job down on the South Bay, and I was like, "All right, guys, I'm done. I'm officially done," <laughs> and went. And we had the baby, took time off, and saved up some money. Somehow, I don't know how, but I saved up some money to take off like two months. Because we were, I'm glad we I did too, because we were clueless first-time parents. Like, I guess, like every parent, first time. Um, and then, sure enough, Ramon called, or the studio called and said, Okay, you are you are given this job doing VizDev if you want it. You know, Ramon wants you, and, and you did great on After Effects stuff, and you want to come in and get set up. And I was like, woohoo! worked you know thank you lord and so all right i guess i hit my video length so I, so that was on kung fu panda 2 and i i got through the doors and got my own office and well i shared an office with different people and basically just learned vizdev and 
just poured myself into VizDev. I, I basically, at that point, was like, I don't care about animation anymore. I'm going to do VizDev. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn how to color. I'm going to learn all this stuff. So, you know, and I bothered Tang all the time. Like, Tang, can you show me how to make this painting better? And I don't understand. How do you do that? And show me. Can you sit down and paint over my painting? And there's a couple of times when I think he got really upset with me because I, I don't know, it might have appeared like I just wasn't learning, you know? You invest in someone, and there's always a time when you're like wondering if your investment was worth it, if they're actually getting it, you know? And so I, I, I always wonder if that's how he felt. But, you know, there was a lot of things that he was real happy about that I did. And I think at the end of the day where he was happy that he hired me. <laughs> at least I hope. Um, we're still really good friends. And actually, I'm, I've been um, trying to get him to, to finish a graphic novel so that I could help him publish it. And, uh, man, it's just the stuff he has done. His personal work is just mind-blowing. So anyway, that's a different story. Someday, you might have a graphic novel out. So that's my little story of how I got into DreamWorks, kinda. That's one kind of rendition of it, I guess. And uh, I was there for about six or seven years doing VizDev. And doing VizDev on Kung Fu Panda 2 was really fun because it was all new. And then as soon as Kung Fu Panda, did I say one or two? On Kung Fu Panda 2 was really fun because it was all new. Um, Kung, as soon as I started, or as soon as that ended, Kung Fu Panda 1, uh, 2, I mean, as soon as Kung Fu Panda 2 ended, I kind of started losing interest in VizDev again. Not again, but started losing interest. And it's because, well, I was putting Remind online and I was starting to get a following and I was starting to get interest in this book that was my own thing and it was the story I wanted to tell. So suddenly it was like, it was really hard to just jump onto another project and be like, all right, Let's invest another two years into this now, you know? I'm going to keep learning. Um, so, you know, I worked on some other little things, like I worked on the Trolls movie real early. Worked on Penguins of Madagascar. Worked on Crudes. Worked on Dino Trucks. when it was in early development. Worked on some apps, some horrible, horrible apps that I don't know why DreamWorks was trying to do apps. And at the time we were all frustrated that why are you guys spending money on apps? You're trying to do an Instagram app. Why? Like, a, just focus on what you're good at. I don't know. They spent so much money on these, trying to develop these apps and oh, it's just like, no one understood why, but they were convinced that it was their chance at making another billion dollars. So whatever. They paid us, and we did beautiful art for these pathetic apps. Sorry. My opinion. Um, and eventually they dropped them, and the apps that they did develop, they, they sold them, and were like, okay, no more apps. Um... Worked on some other shows that never, never got to the light of day, or or that had been in production for like a year and then got canceled, which is a whole another mystery. Like how something can be in production for a year and then get canceled at a studio like that. I don't. I mean, I get it. I see why it's done, but why, why would they allow something to? go on that long is just a mystery to me. I mean, I don't know. 
there's a lot of reasons. It's kind of it's 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 not easy to just explain in a little short video, so <laughs> anyway, um So yeah, it was great while it lasted. I learned a lot and then when my contract was almost up, my second contract, I I felt compelled to move on and I just I didn't see myself there anymore and it didn't I was already kind of feeling unhappy with going into work and I was really eager to change things up and obviously you can you can see exactly why um, let me sign this. And I'm glad I moved on basically. As soon as I as soon as I quit and just made that decision to move on. You know, I did a lot of praying about it, but as soon as I made that decision, it seems like God opened up every single door possible to allow me to move on. So that's it. What do you think? Does that look good? Pretty good, I guess. Alrighty. Well, thanks for watching. If you guys like this piece of art and you guys want to buy it, um, then uh, comment in the in the video or 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 something. Send me a message or something if you want it. Alright, thanks for watching guys. See you next time.